Somebody's Luggage, a collection of themed short stories by Charles Dickens and other Victorian writers. Eminent London headwaiter Mr. Christopher has discovered and purchased a mysterious set of luggage that had been abandoned by its owner in the private hotel and dining establishment where he works. In specific items of the luggage, there is a set of handwritten papers, each containing a story written by the luggage's owner, who is known only to Mr. Christopher as somebody. Episode 5. Discovered in his portmanteau. Part 1 of the story of the obliging Mr. Blorridge. Written by Julia Cecilia Stretton. Mr. Richard Blorridge passed among his neighbours and acquaintances in two significant ways. First as a man of modest temperament, and then of extreme good nature. So that those same friends and neighbours, full of the impudence of the world, often laughed at the former and let no opportunity slip of taking advantage of the latter. It is recorded by his nurse and mother that so amiable a baby was never born. A faint whimper was the only complaint he ever made. As he grew up, it became an established fact that Master Dick was to be washed first or last, taken out or left behind, given sugar plumps or forgotten, as it suited the fancy of every other person, except for Master Dick himself. Thus... He weathered babyhood, childhood, and rushed up into boyhood in a pleasing and satisfactory manner to all parties, himself included. He bore any amount of other people's work and seemed to rather enjoy being put upon. Once, and only once, did a slight attack of ill temper and discontentment strike him, Without any previous notice or the shadow of consultation, his father placed him, at the age of 16, as the most junior of clerks in a bank. Now Dick was a country boy, born and brought up in truly rural fashion. His father, having a small estate, farmed the greater part himself and his children participated in all he did, as much for their own benefits as his, Dick's habits belonged wholly to the country. For this reason, his dismay may be understood when he was suddenly required to exchange breezy hilltops and flowery plains for the high stool and matching higher desk. For the first time in his life, he made a murmur of complaint to his younger brother, called William by birth, Bill by those who had no particular regard for him, and Billy by the fortunate possessors of what affections he had. But I don't like the bank, Billy. I am unhappy. Oh, come, come, old fellow, none of that. The smell of the place makes me sick. I get cramp in my legs from sitting on that high stool. Hold hard, Dick. I won't have you say another word. How dare you talk like that to me? My dear Billy. Don't you dear Billy me. When you know as well as I do that if you don't stay at the bank, I shall have to go there. Oh, Dear. Oh, dear. I wonder you have the heart to hint an objection, Dick, especially knowing, as you do, how you hate the bank, endangering your own brother, and you setting up for being a good-natured fellow too. Dick said no more, but bore up manfully against the smells, cramps, nerves and headaches brought on by working at the bank. Time worked its own cure, and he experienced the truth of that well-established maxim, habit becomes second nature. He exercised his particular vocation by doing a great deal of other people's work besides his own and being generally kind-hearted to everything and everybody. He was universally liked, though vastly imposed upon. Still... Upon his gradual elevation in the course of time from the junior of the juniors to head of all, there was no voice apart from his own that hazarded a doubt as to his fitness. I am a little uncomfortable. Perhaps I've taken the place of someone who may have been more deserving. At last! 
Assured that his abilities and position warranted his choice, Dick resigned himself to being entirely happy and, as a fool essential to a state of bliss, he fell in love. That his choice should light on one so profoundly unlike himself was perfectly natural. A young lady of much beauty and many wants, like a playful kitten, incipient cruelty lurked in her prettiest ways. Indeed, Mr Richard, you are very good. How you have surprised me. And do you really think so well of me? I never thought you really cared a bit for me. I laughed and chatted with you because, as we said, Mr Richard Blorridge was so good-natured. Good-natured to you, Ellen? Oh, heaven, could you read nothing more in my devotion? Oh, you quite amaze me, Mr Richard. Where have you kept these feelings so long? Oh, Ellen, do not trifle with me. Not for worlds, Mr Blorridge. I am no flirt. I am a frank creature and always will be. I thought, I hoped. Oh, Ellen, I would not have dared to speak this and lay bare my heart before you had you not encouraged... Now, Mr Richard, don't say that. I beg. I am sure I am above that. Besides, Mamma wishes me to marry rather high to set a good example to my younger sisters... And indeed, Papa has said to me more than once that he would never suffer me to marry a banker's clerk. I am to be partner in two years. Two years? I may be married long before that. Come, Mr Richard, we can always be the best of friends. And my wife, Ellen? <laughs> oh dear, no. I really wonder you could ever think such a thing. Pray don't tease me any more. Poor Dick's heart swelled and throbbed with many tender emotions. He rallied these bewildering senses and went away speechless in a single bow. There was a quiet dignity and integrity in it that even struck the silly little substitute of a heart that had so mocked him with a stab of misgiving. Now... Poor Dick derived a melancholy satisfaction from working twice as hard as he had ever done before. He was at that once odious office before the doors open and sat on his stool for hours at a stretch regardless of cramp. <laughs> Not even the fast, worldly-wise opinion of brother William, Bill or Billy could make him think he was ill-used. She's a flirt and no mistake. I saw through her long ago, Dick. I always said she would jilt you. Oh, you wrong her, William, deeply. She was right. She deserves a better fate than to be the wife of a banker's clerk. Pooh! Pooh! <laughs> Why, you have a share in the firm already, and I hope to the Lord you will soon get rich. It would be devilish comfortable, Dick, always to be able to turn to you when one wants five or ten pounds. Do you want a little money now, Billy? I have no occasion to hoard money. The very thing, my dear fellow. I never was so hard up. It's a great comfort to me, Dick, that you didn't marry that simpleton of a girl. Hush, Bill. Well, it's a very good thing for yourself, then. I'll swear she was a fortune hunter. Forbear, Bill. Well, it was an uncommon good thing for her, then. Twenty-five pounds will do. Thank you, Dick. In fact... The volatile Ellen had married within six months of Blighting Dick to an honourable by name, if not by nature, the grand title being of much more consequence than the fact. Now, Mr Blorridge was excited because he was dining for the first time in his own new, substantial, elegant and luxurious house – a gem that only lacked one more thing for absolute perfection. Though naturally a sober man, in his excitement, he drank success to it and health to himself just about once too often. Dick had grown rich. Nobody quite knew how, as he was always helping everyone. He had made one or two fortunate speculations... He had been left a large legacy by a fellow clerk at the bank, 
old Grobus, who had never given him a civil word when alive, but remarked in his will, <coughs> I bequeath everything to Richard Blorridge, my heir, who will be sure to spend it better than I could. With this money, Richard Blorridge acquired one or two bits of land that no one but a good-natured fool would buy. But no sooner did they become dicks than they were discovered to be invaluable. The railway ran straight through them. The land was the very thing for building purposes – and when he decided to build himself a new house on this improved and flourishing estate, everyone, far and near, entered into the scheme. Of course, there was now to be a housewarming, a dinner and dance. Thinking of this celebration that was to be the very next day, Dick threw himself into a softly cushioned armchair and took another glass of wine, oblivious of having already toasted success to the house rather too often. So they both come, Fanny and Florence, lovely creatures. I don't know which is the prettier of the two cousins. Bill doesn't like Fanny. He says she is like Ellen. He does seem rather fond of Florence. I must find that out. It would never do to ruin poor Bill's happiness. I was madly in love with Ellen, but I got over it. It certainly is time I married, but I shouldn't like to be served that way. Bill says, I am a great fool if I am taken in again. Oh, I don't understand women at all. I believe every word they say. I adore their sweet smiles and could not think badly of them for the world. I suppose I am a fool, as Bill says. What a thing it would be for me if some kind-hearted, honest genie or fairy would bestow upon the walls of my house the gift of making people appear just as they are, speak just what they think, and be altogether as God and nature made them. Ha! Oh, my dear sir, take care. Looking towards the sound, Dick saw a tiny little lady perched on the arm of the chair that he had just thumped, steadying herself by holding valiantly on to the elaborately crocheted antimacassar. I... I beg your pardon. Granted. Now open your hand and hold it steady. She took a flying leap into the middle of his palm. Thank you, Dick. So... You want your house to be gifted with the power of making people speak the truth, eh? I should, should like it. Oh, no, you won't like it. You will find it very annoying. None of your servants, friends or relations will seem the better for it, Dick. Oh, I should like to try it for a little while, just for one day. I understand. Merely to enable you to select a wife... You fear to be made a fool of again, Dick. Yes, yes. Marriage is such an awful thing. One does not mind being made a fool of for a short time, but for life. How pretty you are. I only show my beauty to those who appreciate me. My name is Verita. God bless the name. I don't care about the enchantment of my house. If you will always be at hand to advise me. I mean to live with you, Dick. But as for advice, why did God give you an intelligence to guide you through every difficulty? Why ask a little odd spirit for advice when you have to but knock at the door of your conscience for unerring guidance? 
True, but still. I see you hold to your own way, Dick. And as I wish you to have a good wife, I will grant your request. But as enchanting the whole house would be extremely inconvenient to you in more ways than one, I shall confine the spell to this chair. However, there are two conditions to be observed. Name them. First, no one but yourself is to know of the power the chair possesses. Dear me, would that be quite fair? Oh, simpleton. Who could you get to sit in your chair if its power were known? Wouldn't people like it? I shouldn't mind. I dare say you would not. But just the chair is to be enchanted. I consent. The second condition is that whoever enters your doors must sit in the chair and must answer three questions before leaving the chair. But suppose people will not do one or the other. I will take it upon myself to ensure compliance for the first condition. The second depends on you, as you must ask the three questions. What sort of questions? Pooh, pooh, Dick. Don't give me more than my fair share of work. If you don't know the sort of questions to put, you are undeserving of my favour. I must now be gone. The night is rather chilly, I think. Good night, Dick. And good fortune to this house. May it soon possess the only charm it lacks. A pretty wife for you and a good mistress for itself. Before Mr Blorridge had time to answer, the palm of his hand was empty and the fair little creature had disappeared. Mr Blorridge sat thinking and dozing. The dining room door had opened and shut several times, which had probably been Penge, his new butler. He was the most respectful and obsequious of butlers, with a character so very unexceptional that he had almost felt inclined to thank the spotless Penge for being so good as to take him for a master. Mr Blorridge rose and called for his servant. He was about to speak to the excellent Penge when he was arrested by seeing the modest butler seat himself in the chair he had just vacated. The enchanted chair. Thank you, sir. <sighs> I have some snuff here, sir. <sighs> it is my only vice, sir. I trust it is not disagreeable. Will you take a pinch? No ceremony required here. My word. <laughs> well, Blorridge, with great self-possession, you have a right to amuse yourself at your pleasure, but you're drunk. Penge? Blorridge, I ain't to be put out of the truth by you. You're drunk. Or drunk or sober, I think I am a gentleman, Penge. You may think so, but I don't. My ideas of a real gent ain't by no manner of means the same as yours, Blorridge. And what are your ideas? My ideas are racers, out and outers, sport, life. Them's my ideas of a real gentleman, not your slow games. Blorridge, you're a muff. Oh, at all events, I hope you are comfortable, Penge. I hope that at least you like my service. No, I don't, Blorridge. I am formed for enjoyment. And how can I know enjoyment under a mean-spirited screw that keeps the keys of his own cellar? But you agreed with me, Penge, when I engaged you, that it was the most satisfactory arrangement for all parties. You said you preferred it. Blurridge, I considered it as looked well to say. And having heard as you were soft and easy, I said to myself, Penge, you stick that in him and you'll have the key before your first year is out. Which is what I expect, Blorridge. Or you and me parts. Burning to release the prisoner, Mr Blorridge was racking his brains for the last question. Who can that be, Penge? That awful young scamp of your brother. Penge instantly rose out of his chair. <gasps> oh. Oh. I, I ask your pardon, sir. I felt very giddy just now, sir. That if I had not took the liberty to take a seat... 
I must have fainted. Never mind, Penge. Oh, thank you, sir. I believe that is Mr William's ring, sir. He is such a cheerful young gentleman, sir. I know the liveliness of his ring. Excuse me, sir. Mr William for you, sir. No, Bill, don't sit there. Oh, no, too late. <laughs> ah, hello, Dick. What do you want with the best chair in the room? It's very unlike such a good-natured chap as you to appropriate the most comfortable seat. Dick sat down on the edge of another chair and wiped his forehead. He racked his brains for three simple, harmless questions that would not commit the sitter. Um, is it a fine night, Billy? Rather too fine for me. I want to skulk off to the gaming tables without being seen. I came here on my way, partly to blind mother, partly to twist a fine per note out of you. How is our mother? Precious cross. Bothering as much about my goings-on as if I was cutting my teeth. Ah, uh, ah, uh, are you in love, Bill? Yes, with myself. What's the good of loving anything else? I don't find anyone so juiced fond of me as to forget him or herself. Oh, I thought Florence... Florence be hanged. Do you suppose I don't see that you are spoony upon Florence? But looky here, Dick, you want to marry. Now, I don't intend to let you marry. I'm not going to stand your being thrown away upon any other than your own relations. Oh, come out of that chair, Bill! I won't! It's a comfortable chair! I'm bent on telling you my mind. My mind has been full of you, Dick, ever since you began to build this house. That's a suspicious gallery shut off by a green baize door there. I said it when I saw it. That means mischief. He means that part of the house for a nursery. Come out of that chair, Bill. I tell you, I won't. As you are getting married, I'm not afraid of Fanny. Her temper will never let stand a month's courtship. She'll show her teeth in a fortnight. I said to myself, Dick is safe from her. But Florence may be dangerous. Therefore... I'll pretend to be a little affected in that direction myself. Here, Bill, take five pounds, take ten pounds, but come out of that chair. I would have done it for less than that, Dick, but as you're so flush and free with money, I'll take the ten. <coughs> oh, <clears throat> good evening, Dick. I, I promised Mother to be back for tea. With this sudden change, Mr William, Bill, took himself out of the chair and took his leave. Mr Richard rushed upstairs and dived into bed. Oh, and as if fearing that the chair would pursue him even there and entice people to commit themselves, he pulled the bedclothes over his head and was fortunate in being unconscious for the rest of the night. The chair of truth is firmly established in Mr Blorridge's new home. Will he succumb to its truth-telling virtues? How will things go with its presence at the housewarming party? Will all be well by the time it ends? Listen to the next and final part of the story of the obliging Mr Blorridge. <laughs>